All right, let's do it. I'm gonna talk about Startup Safe, which is one entrepreneur, that would be me, one, one, one particular journey supported by Safe. So if you don't know about me, just a little bit about me, I'm a serial entrepreneur. Um, my last company was Continuo, which was acquired by Scaled Agile in 2019. And then last year, uh, after the integration uh, work was completed, uh, I decided that I wanted to start First Root. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, I'm also the co-founder of a nonprofit that promotes civic engagement, Every Voice Engaged Foundation. I helped form the first Agile conference uh, way back in 2003. I've been honored to serve on the board of the Agile Alliance, and I've done uh, quite a lot of work with the Scrum Alliance, and I've written a few books, um, all of them with really long titles, some of them that have actually sold copies. Uh, so what makes a good startup? Well, you want to have a compelling problem, and you have to have a sufficiently large market. Otherwise, you won't attract customers or investors you need something that's desirable, viable, feasible, and sustainable. So it's gotta be wanted by the market. It's gotta be viable. Your, your team makes money at it. It's gotta be feasible. Your team can do it. And it's gotta be sustainable. It's not just doing it once, it's doing it repeatedly. You do need a caring and competent team because startups are hard. They take a lot of time and energy. And you have to be both a little humble and a little crazy to try and think that you're gonna make the world better. So let's kind of look at this from the lens of first route. What's the compelling problem? Well, we're trying to fight financial inequality around the world, pretty big market. And we're using a participatory budgeting app to do it. And I think we've got a pretty much uh, caring and competent team. Uh, my team right now is distributed. Uh, I've got some developers, uh, well, some members of the team in Bangalore, some members of the team uh, in Madeira, Mexico, and a few other spots in Mexico, and a few members of the team across the U.S. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm both humble, but I'm also crazy. If anyone remembers this thing called Innovation Games, when I introduced Innovation Games in 2003, at the first Agile conference, everyone was thinking these are nuts. And now they're some of the most widely techniques, uh, you, what most widely used techniques in the Agile community. So what are some ways to build your startup? Well, you, you, can, you, you wanna make sure that you're understanding your customers, which of course relates to design thinking, which means you're collaborating with your market and your customers. You have to actually figure out, you know, I'll use an American dollar sign, but you have to actually make sure that you understand what your economic forecasts are. You have to experiment. And the, a great way to experiment is to use the lean startup. You've got to plan your releases because there are market events and market rhythms. And since you're a startup and you're new, you pretty much don't have an architectural runway. It's a pretty important concept and safe, but when I, when, I'm, when I don't have anything at all, then by definition, I have to build my architectural runway. These are all critical things. And so you start to say, hey, wait a minute, what's going on? What method out there in the Agile community has all that? Well, I don't wanna be uh, critical of any other method, but only SAFE has the necessary components and the tools that we need as a startup. All of that is in SAFE. So what we need to do now is we have to figure out how to get it out of SAFE and tailored in a way that works for startups. Turns out that's not that hard. There's four configurations of SAFE, starting with the essential configuration and moving up through the portfolio, large solution and full configuration. The most common uh, configuration of SAFE, in my opinion, is the portfolio uh, configuration of SAFE. It is used in a surprisingly large number of uh, environments and works extremely well because it allows me as a leader in a mid-size or even a startup company to have all of the tools I need to make the decisions that need to be made. So when I look at this and what I'm gonna do in this talk is I'm gonna start with, the, with some aspects of the portfolio level and essential safe and the lean portfolio management competency and the agile product delivery competency and kind of talk about uh, what I'm gonna be uh, tailoring. So there's some things I'm gonna keep, there's some things I'm gonna change and there's some things I'm gonna defer. Let's start with the things I'm gonna defer. 
In Portfolio Safe, I have two really powerful tools, the Portfolio Canvas, which gives me a complete canvas or a complete snapshot of all of my uh, solutions in my portfolio and the value streams that they create them. I don't need that though as a startup because I only have one thing I'm building. The portfolio canvas in SAFE is derived from the business model canvas. So I can use that. So if you look over here, I've got keep. SAFE talks about both the business model canvas and the lean canvas. And so we're gonna keep one of those. And we at First Root decided to keep the business model canvas. The second thing that we can defer because I'm a startup is I don't need my solutions by horizon because by definition, I only have one solution. I have a horizon three solution that I wanna push into horizon one through experimentation as fast as I can. Now, I also wanna keep my strategic themes. I wanna keep my ability to estimate my work. I absolutely wanna keep the lean startup. I wanna keep market events and market rhythms, which help me know when I'm going to need to release my software. And what I'm gonna change is, is vision. The portfolio vision becomes the company vision. The cadence of the portfolio is gonna adjust a little bit because I don't have a PI zero. And in a startup, it can take a bit of time before you get into the PI cadence. My company is working on a cadence right now but it's a slightly different cadence than the PI cadence. And I will talk about that in a few slides. Finally, you absolutely must keep participatory budgeting because the leaders of the startup and the investors at times need to be involved in decision-making so that we can understand, are we investing in the right choices? Now, I wanna dig into a few other elements of portfolio safe, which are absolutely essential for startups. The most important to me is the safe managed investment contract. As a startup, I don't want to hire a bunch of employees right up front. That's a pretty big commitment. And even in America where uh, hiring people isn't that hard, it does come with some significant costs. So what I wanna do is I want to create a relationship with an outside set of providers that really is mutually beneficial. And that's the whole purpose of the safe management uh, managed investment contract. The safe managed investment contract is designed to create a long-term collaborative relationship. Um, so, okay, this is my old name of the company, Tilladin. It should say first root there. I'll come to that. But first, you want to use someone you know and trust. And I have a couple of people that I've worked with over the years, and I know them and I trust them. And when I was ready to start first root, it was easy for me to reach out to them. We want to give them a fair commitment. And that's one of the principles of the safe managed investment contract. It's got to be long enough to be valuable. So we started with a six month. We wanted a, a cadence that works. And I want everyone to consider some of the standard in the community. Almost every agile shop I know just automatically assumes that their cadence is two weeks or three weeks. They don't even think about it. And it's a, a bit of a frustration for me because your iterations and your durations of your iterations or sprints should be chosen to meet the needs of your company. When you're brand new, two weeks is too long. You wanna shorten that iteration to maximize the opportunities for formal conversations about the learning that is going on with the team. So at uh, First Root, we run one week iterations. And then what I do, and this, this isn't always done by other people, I make no distinction between my contractors and my employees. I treat everyone the same. If I'm gonna send someone to a class, I send everyone to the class. If I'm gonna get books or we, we do something together, everyone does it together. So I was dealing with a new dev team and I wanted them to improve and make sure that we were aligned on, especially automation and testing and the CICD pipeline. So SAFE has a series of uh, videos um, uh, that are fantastic done by Ken Pugh about um, uh, engineering practices and safe and CICD pipelines and testing. And they were awesome. So every sprint we assigned on the backlog the requirement that the team watch the video and every week we would review the results as a team. 
And that's another important thing to, to remember. The backlog exists to let the team know what work is important and valuable. So if you want your team to read a book, if you want your team to watch a video, you have to put it on the backlog because it's part of the work you want them to do. I also made sure the team uh, um, uh, looked at and I gave them our investor pitch. And we even did a participatory budgeting process with my contractors where I gave them money to invest. And uh, we did it in what we call logo gear. So like what logo gear do we want? T-shirts or pens or pencils or coffee mugs. But we did it through participatory budgeting so that the team could learn the process in the first few weeks of joining the company. And every time someone joins, we run another PB process. Now, you really wanna focus on agile product delivery as a startup. And this is the competency in SAFE where we talk about building a continuous flow of the valuable products and services. We've got customer centricity and design thinking, we've got technical practices, and we've got human-centric practices for the developers, which is why we develop on Cadence. Developing on Cadence is very human-centric for the developers because we have complex lives. We have to know, for example, when we're going to be meeting in a standup and being a global team, uh, we do our standups uh, at a time that's not too late for our, uh, our, our uh, uh, counterparts in India, but not too early for me. So our standups we do at 7.30 in the morning, California time. That's not too early for me. And it's not too late for my team in Bangalore. And it's just right for my team in Mexico. So we want to look at the humanity of the people and when we're doing cadence. Customers don't have the same demand. Customers decouple and safe decouples the, the development cadence from when you're ready to release. Being a startup and with, a, you know, with an increasingly mature CI to CD pipeline, we can release multiple times a day if we need to. And uh, not that we do, but we can. And so when the value is ready, you wanna release it. So that's why safe decouples Release, uh, releasing the solution from the cadence of the development solution. You wanna think of the humanity of your developers when you're working on cadence. So what are we gonna keep? What are we gonna change? And are we gonna add anything to our agile product delivery con uh, uh, um, uh, uh, competency? There's a lot here. We're gonna absolutely keep our vision, our value proposition canvas, our CI CD pipeline, we're gonna keep journey maps. However, we're gonna reframe how we do journey maps. I'm gonna talk about that later. I'm a huge fan of comics and graphic novels. And while I know the design and the UX community prefers this kind of more structured form of uh, uh, journey mapping, I personally prefer writing stories. And I like to communicate those stories through comics so that we can feel our personas come to life as characters and stories. So I, uh, you'll see some of that in a bit. SAFE talks a lot about testing, um, which is fantastic. It's a little light on usability testing. It's there, but it's a little light. For a startup, you really have to put a lot of emphasis in usability testing. Of course, we need story maps. Of course, we need a CI CD pipeline. And I'm gonna talk extensively about the uh, architectural runway. Now, I was just talking about this. Before the story map, there is a story. This is an example, and all of these artifacts are available. If you want them, we've open sourced these artifacts, and you can have copies of our personas and our stories uh, if you want them. But our main persona for teachers is Mrs. Laura Stonehouse. And you can see through this, this map how she comes to be uh, acquainted with our company and what she's trying to do. Now, you've got a tension in all of Agile, safe included. Developers want small things that they can fit into an iteration with really good clarity, but designers need to focus on the vision. So developers are kind of at the bottom of the mountain climbing it. Designers are at the top of the mountain trying to say, come on up to this place. So we use a tool called Figma. Um, it's a fantastic tool. And in Figma, we have the entire app laid out. 
And that's what we use for our usability testing and our concept testing. But there's no way the development team can implement this. And so what we do when we're getting into an iteration is we clarify the detailed flows. Now, what's interesting and what's not on this deck right now is after we were working about six months, we realized in one of our retrospectives that the designers hadn't yet absorbed some of the choices of the developers. Uh, we use Flutter uh, for our UI and Flutter had some limitations. And so what we did was we had a big meeting between the UI team, which I think of the people as being more implementation centric and the UX team for customer experience. And what we did was we took some of the insights that we were getting out of the Flutter development, fed them back into the designs so that the designers were starting to design things that were more easily implemented. But you test and confirm the vision and you implement the iteration. And this is some examples of our app in action. You can see that when students create a proposal for a participatory budgeting process, that they're gonna be using uh, layouts that are very familiar to them from places like uh, Instagram. And then this is what the voting looks like. Now, Safe Collaborate also does uh, participatory budgeting, but the Safe uh, Collaborate version is optimized for what adults need. It, it, uh, Safe Collaborate is optimized for strategic decision-making and complex decisions and complex portfolios. That kind of complexity is actually overwhelming to students. So we simplify uh, the voting process in participatory budgeting so that uh, students have a, a, a much more understandable and a much easier to use uh, interaction model. Now, when you have no solution, it is all architectural runway. And the first thing to do is start with an Uber architecture. If you're building a new startup and it's going to be a cloud-centric startup, you're not gonna build everything from scratch. You're pretty much gonna pick Google Cloud, AWS, or Microsoft Azure. Those are the three leading solutions. Now I know there are other cloud providers. And if you work for one of those companies, I do not mean to offend you. In Silicon Valley, these are the three big choices. Now, what we ended up choosing, and it was based on the experience of the team, they had experience with Amazon. So it was an easy choice. And, I'm, and I'm, again, I'm not saying anything negative about the other platform choices. Had the team I started working with had a ton of Google Cloud experience, we might be over in Google Cloud. There are times where you have to honor the experience of the team that you're getting and what they like and what they're good at. And now there are other elements of runway. Our app came out the door fully localized into multiple languages and internationalized. We have a cross-platform client because we know that's required in schools. It's got to work on Mac and PC. It's got to work on tablets, on Chromebooks, on Androids, on iPhones. It has to work everywhere. We have to have a gorgeous UI. Kids aren't going to use anything that's ugly. We want an API-driven model with an event-sourced architecture because that lets me scale. We want to use data architectures that are based on patterns. And we want to make sure, because we're dealing with kids, that we're compliant with all of the necessary regulations that can control how we interact with data and how we interact with privacy. Now, when you don't have what's in SAFE known as the program increment, when you don't have a, an ongoing system, then there's, there's no PI zero, right? So you, you don't have anything to start with. So you start with these iterations one week long, and you're really focusing on the plan, do, check, act cycle. So what did I do? I really worked on helping my team understand participatory budgeting. I gave them articles to read. We did a process. We talked about lots of stuff that had them watch videos. We made sure the team was aligned on the vision. I gave them copies of the pitch deck. I had them ask me questions. We talked with, we interviewed people. We chose the Uber architecture. We invested a lot in the data model, so we spiked it. We designed the vision and we spiked it to make sure Flutter would work for us. I'll come back to that in a little bit. We designed the API and then we spiked the API, so we made sure that we were using the right thing. Now, um, I said I'd come back to the UI. We started with React 
React didn't give us the capabilities we were looking for. So we switched to Flutter. And the spiking there gave us fast feedback and learning that let us make the right choice. We started with a REST API, but while the team was working, they found and learned about something called GraphQL. And they came to me and they said, hey, Luke, I know that we said we were gonna use uh, REST, but we've found this other tool, GraphQL, and it looks much better. After a lot of back and forth discussions, we decided to spike GraphQL and we liked it so much more, we switched from REST to GraphQL. Now, I spend a lot of time in uh, the data place uh, and the data model because I think that that's central to developing good systems. And I cringe when developers go to a new system and they start designing their data model from, from scratch. That is just really a, not a good idea. We have published patterns in software for a reason. And those patterns really do matter. So we introduced the team to patterns. One of my favorite books is David Hayes' uh, Enterprise Model Patterns. And it was very complex, but we, we, we took all of this wisdom and we implemented it in a way that's appropriate for us. So I strongly advise that when people are working, they start with a, a published patterns. And in fact, any developer in any system, if you're starting something from scratch, I actually think that you're being somewhat irresponsible to be, to be completely candid. You should not start from scratch in, in just about any system that is being built today. You should start by looking at what patterns are appropriate and what can I leverage? So we also did a custom state model. Now there is no pattern for the state flow and the state process of participatory budgeting. So what we had to do with uh, the, what we were doing in schools was we had to start by mapping out each state of the participatory budgeting process. And then when a proposal was created, what are all of the states of a proposal? And it's hard to read. The purpose of this slide isn't to give you something to read, but it's to let you know that before we were slinging code, we were really spending time comparing our experiences and the literature on participatory budgeting to build uh, with, with our reality and building out a state diagram. So a few more notes, and then I can handle questions. Um, sunk emotions can be harder than sunk costs. And so you'll hear this phrase in the Agile community or in, in portfolio management, you know, uh, don't, you know, ignore sunk costs. Well, a cost is, is, is a money. It, it doesn't have any feelings. Money doesn't have any feelings. We give money feelings. And the thing that you have to be careful about isn't the money, it's your emotions. We make investments in a certain thing and then we have trouble changing. So like I said, we made an investment in React and we switched to Flutter. If the team had somehow identified themselves as React programmers, that would have been hard to change but they didn't identify themselves as React programmers. They identified themselves as, we wanna create the best solution for the kids using participatory budgeting. And when you focus on the, when you fall in love with the problem, not the way you're solving the problem, it's easier to make changes. We also explored REST, like I said, and then chose Graph. We had to change the name of the company and we dealt initially with some pretty nasty performance issues. Uh, the team was using some new technology and we just had misconfigured some things and we didn't know why. And I even joked that, hey, we ordered some mugs from the, from the and even our first logo gear came out broken and busted. Um, and our first release was incomplete. The students created proposals, but they couldn't even vote. It was, it was really kind of amazing that we got something up and running so quickly, but it was also incomplete. So you have to be trusting the team to be able to pull off something like that. But boy, oh boy, startups sure are fun. I mean, um, you, you work harder than you've ever imagined and you love every minute because you know your work matters. This is from a book called The Spirit Level. And what they did was they looked at countries around the world, uh, not every country, but many countries around the world. And they studied the effects of income inequality on health and social problems. And using America as our example, America is the most 
unequal country in the world. And America has the worst health and social problems in the world. We have the lowest levels of trust, the highest levels of obesity, the highest levels of drug and alcohol addiction, the highest rates of imprisonment and incarceration, the uh, abysmal uh, infant mortality. So for me, the, the work of First Root is attacking all of these things through the lens of creating a more equal society. And to me, that work matters. And we know the students are loving it. We completed our first in uh, several more pilots right now. And the students really love the opportunity to be in control of money. We're learning and growing and we are very deeply thankful to have SAFE to guide our efforts because as an entrepreneur, I wanna grow. And when I grow, I wanna keep using the same method. If I don't start with SAFE, then I'm gonna have to change my method as I grow. And I don't wanna do that. I wanna have one consistent thing that supports me as a small startup and as a big, sophisticated, meaningful company. Thank you so much uh, for your time. And I'm gonna go ahead and um, um, switch to uh, uh, see if there's any chats. Uh, see, I gotta figure out how to get to the chat. There it is. Uh, see if there's any questions in chat or see if there's anyone who wants to say anything. Um, uh, I believe you, there is a question in chat from Monica. Yeah, so the first is, um, where can you find the safe ASC videos? Just search Scaled Agile Framework ASC videos or go to the video series. It's, it's easy to find on the SAFE website. Um, uh, Monica, was the team involved to make these decisions? Monica, that depends on the decision that was being made. Um, the team um, had influence on the Uber architecture of, of, cl of, micro, of uh, Google Cloud, of um, Azure and uh, Amazon, because uh, I think of them as largely equal. I know a lot of people would cringe when I say that, but. I don't really think that Azure is uniquely better, you know, for starting from scratch than Amazon Web Services. Um, I think it's really based on the decision of the team. Um, so they had a very um, uh, strong uh, uh, opinion about that. The team, however, did not have as much decision-making power over the kind of architecture that we were building. Um, I required, I specified and required that we are using an event sourcing architecture because those are the kinds of architectures uh, that matter. Um, and there is a role of an architect in SAFE and, and architects make certain decisions. The only other thing that I would say is the team was not allowed to say, we're gonna ignore data model patterns and we're gonna invent our data model completely from scratch um, because that's inefficient. So uh, there are some decisions that the team made there are some decisions the team was heavily involved with, and there were some decisions that um, were given to the team um, by me saying, look, we're gonna use David Hayes and Martin Fowler's uh, data model patterns. So I, I think mm -hmm. you just have to be thoughtful about, you know, when you say what decisions are people involved with, you know, it depends on how, how you know, Monica, you have this great photo in our session of your children. That's, ask yourself, what decisions do I let my children make? And usually it's based on their skill and experience. You're not gonna let your child tell you how you should invest your money, but you might ask your child what they want for dinner and put them in control of helping cook it. Great analogy, Brooke. No, thank you. But great to see, uh, to involve teams in making some key decisions wherein at least uh, they have a say and they have expertise. So definitely a live example that you, can see difference being made if team chose some or made some decision. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you want to you want to give people as much decision making authority as you can. But, you know, the I, I wrote an article year like decades ago um, 